Welcome everybody and thank you for joining uh, the MBRA third ADAS webinar and today we are partnered with um, Richard Taylor from Aztec, your business development director and we're also joined with Pete Sadler, commercial director from North East Accident Repair. So, Good afternoon. Pete's joined us because he's invested in this equipment and he's also a member of the MBRA. So there'll be personal questions that come up throughout the webinar where Pete would like to jump in and um, give contribution as to why he's purchased the Aztec solution, Reds Diagnostics. Um, and obviously Richard is the font of all knowledge, Aztec and Reds Diagnostics. So um, without further ado, should we go on to the next slide now? So, who are Tech Red Diagnostic, Aztec Red Diagnostic? Because it was just Aztec, and now you, 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 was it Aztec that purchased Red Diagnostics? Richard? Yeah. Give us uh, a little bit of an intro onto that. Yeah, early, earlier part of the year, and, I, and I'll go through that as we talk about the, the products and bits and pieces. But yeah, that was an earlier part of this year. I think it was March, April time we acquired Red Diagnostics based in Dunstable. Okay. And technology and vehicles still evolving? Yeah. Uh, rapid rate. Yeah. I can, I can remember talking about ADAS back in fashion, back in 2016. And I think the technology has probably stayed the same. It's just, it's just a lot more volume of vehicles with the technology that's now assigned to it. And the problem of actually repairing the vehicles is getting more and more challenging as they come through the repair shops. So, you know, that's one of the reasons the webinar today is with Aztec and Red Solutions because they have a solution for some of the security on the vehicles and they have quite a good package bundled up for MBRA members in relation to costs and profitability. So um, things we'll be mentioning on the webinar today is top tips for ADAS and at the back end of the webinar there will be the MBRA members offer. So this is being recorded at the moment. So if, if you don't get all of the detail from the webinar, then you'll be able to go onto the website through the members area and actually view this again or pass it on to any of the members of your company so they can view it. And it will also go out as a presentation. So you can sit down and read it and look at the offers and the costings in your own time. You want to move on? All right, Richard. Yeah, so Tom's already mentioned this. So I, I think it's you know, anybody that sees cars now will will understand that they are becoming more complex. Uh, they've been described as kind of vehicles uh, or computers on wheels as opposed to vehicles. Uh, there's very few cars now that leave the production line that don't have some kind of a desk technology built into them. Um, and as it states, there are at least one piece. There are numerous pieces of ADAS technology built into cars now, all of which do you know different things or, or similar things. Uh, and we've actually got a slide later just to kind of bring that to life to help people understand exactly what technology we are now facing as far as the, the vehicles that are being put on the road are concerned. Um, Tom also mentioned this, but I will go into this in a bit of detail, that cars are now protected with secure gateways. Um, that's some of the vehicle manufacturers are now starting to put secure gateways within their vehicles so that it makes it, uh, well, it depends how you look at it, it makes it harder to get access to the vehicle information. Uh, we've used the word manage access there. Uh, I originally had to re remove access. Um, but that's things like Nissan's, as an example, have, you know, four, maybe five security gateways built into their cars. And the, the problem with that is, is that a lot of the aftermarket devices that you can buy yourselves um, won't open up all the different security gateways on the vehicles. And therefore, when you're doing scans or diagnostics checks on vehicles, you may not see all of the fault codes or all the issues that those cars in particular have on them if it won't open the secure gateways. And this, and as the example, will allow an aftermarket device to open up the diesels and emissions gateways. But if you try and get access to the sensors and the windscreens, the bumpers, uh, wing mirrors, et cetera, then um, they are secured now, which means you can't actually access those using the aftermarket tools. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail, I guess, a bit later on in the webinar. I also think that, um, you know, some of the reasons for, you know, the increase in technologies as we move to full autonomy of vehicles, um, the, you know, the, 
the, the gateway will also be there because there'll need to be um, a pro, uh, an access, an audit trail for access. You, you can't, you know, in an autonomous vehicle, and given the, the levels of um, complexity and, and what these cars can do now, having that audit trail, you know, you wouldn't let anyone into a server in, into your office just playing around with it. You know, it's the same with the car. Yeah. You know, they'll need to be able to prove what's being done on when and by whom. So I think the secure gateway, you know, at some point, every car will have this. And, you know, when you think in, in electric cars, there's no servicing, you know, there will need to be a revenue stream for, for manufacturers as well. And I think, you know, that might well be that, uh, you know, that, that there'll be a charge to get it. I don't know that. That's my own personal opinion. But, you know, that with everything that goes on now in a car, it, it will be important to know who's done what and when. Yeah, so this isn't as a result of us coming, you know, Brexit, coming out of Europe and then locking it down and saying, right, you haven't got any rights to get into any of these vehicles anymore. This is purely for the security of the actual vehicle and the consumer um, and protecting what data is in that vehicle to make sure it can't be hacked and harm someone deliberately. Yeah, and I guess what it means is that either the end user of, of any product or device that they may purchase needs to be aware of which vehicles have this security gateways built into them because it just means that the device that they've purchased may not give them access to the relevant secure gateways they need to be able to read to get a validation of what fault codes or what errors are on those particular cars. Uh, this is another minefield of, of issue that, that people have to be mindful of when they get through the process of, of scanning cars and diagnosing faults. Yeah, no, cool. Well, let's, let's move on to the next slide then. Perfect. So um, Tom mentioned this. So we, we acquired Red Diagnostics uh, early part of the year. So Azteca and I joined the business was an OE only service. It's a remote plug-in device. You plug into the OBD2 port that gives you access to remote technicians who will then use the OE tool on the vehicle to do any scanning, diagnostics, calibrations, coding, et cetera, going live with the OE tool as you would if you drove your car to a vehicle manufacturer dealership. By acquiring RED, it gave us access to additional products that we didn't have previously. Uh, and there's a few on here that I'll talk about. Uh, one is the digital ADAS kit. Um, so that's for any repairers or anybody that would like to do calibrations themselves in-house within their body shop as opposed to taking the vehicles to dealerships or getting a third party in who may or may not have that kit to come in and do the calibrations within the, the body shop, within that service process. Um, that's something that we'll talk about in a bit more detail later in terms of the offer that we give out to people now in terms of those kits and, and how they're becoming more available for people to take those options up. The other one that we have, which is causing a bit of confusion, and I'll try and remove some of the confusion, is that Red had a relation, has a relationship with Adatex, um, and they provide the VHC 2.5 diagnostics device that Adatex now promote as the VHC uh, 2.5. So there will be some members of yours, Tom, that will have the VHC 2.5 device. Yeah. Uh, that comes as two devices. There's a tablet which will do your standard scanning, diagnostics, that kind of stuff. Um, on the mainstream vehicles it also comes now with a separate device which is a, a kind of a dongle uh, and we'll show an image of this in, in a second and that effectively then gives you access to the technicians um, so you don't require an Aztec unit if you have a VHC 2.5 unit because that dongle in, in the box will give you access to the technicians that we have in our office in Peter Lee kind of effectively in real time who can then provide that service on the vehicles you can't read using your standard aftermarket tools and that's kind of the difference between the two different products yeah, and you'll see images on the next slide. Yeah, and the last point on there, last point on there before we flip on is just that we have a workshop solutions business. Um, at the moment, there's a, there's about three vans that we have that we can kind of move around the country to help support body shops. Uh, they can do a number of things. They can do scanning, they can do calibrations, they can do fault code clearing, coding, programming, etc. cetera. Um, and they also can get involved in some of the more technical work. Uh, we've seen various jobs since we've launched this where repairers have struggled to get calibrations done and it's been down to wiring or you know, other problems that that vehicle's currently got uh, that need to be rectified prior to calibrations being done. So that's just the kind of fail safe. If you can't do it yourself, our technicians can't do it remotely and there's still an issue with the car and you require someone to have a look at it, we have got a workshop solutions business that we can send to come and do that car, depending on whereabouts you are in the UK. And that's a business we're looking at building up to be a UK-wide business as opposed to just the specific areas we covered today. All right, so if it's a nightmare job, then it's best to go on for that last solution. And that's capped yeah. at a certain amount as well, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, exactly. That's capped at a price. We, we also can, in some instances, 
go and get the vehicle, take it down to our office in Dunstable and actually do it in-house as well, depending on how yeah. safe the car is in terms of the requirement it needs. So it's just trying to cover off as many of the things that a repairer might face when it comes to the new technology that's built into cars. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll go into this in a bit more detail then. So the VAC 2.5, so if you can see the image on your right, the bottom image of your right, effectively the big tablet is your, your 2.5 tablet that you will effectively plug into a car and do your scanning and diagnostics using that device. That's effectively what we call an aftermarket device, and that device is data-driven. So effectively it will have a source of data that's in that device that will be used to read that vehicle to try and obtain fault codes or diagnostics issues um, based upon the vehicle that it is currently talking to. Effectively, if that device doesn't have the data in it to cover the vehicle that you're trying to do a scan or diagnostics clearing on, then that little dongle just down in front of it, to the right as we look at it, is effectively the dongle that you'll plug into the car. That will then connect you to our technicians in Peter Lee. They can then complete scanning, diagnostics, fault code clearing, calibrations, coding, etc., over the air to support those newer vehicles. To put it into logic, they would be the vehicles that invariably you would either take to a dealer to have that work done or alternatively get a third party in to come and do that job for you because that device won't recognize the vehicle. And is That's that you good. patching into the OEM system then? From your yeah, so technicians? I will explain this in, uh, probably in a bit more detail later, but effectively okay. uh, that, links, that links into, so the way that works is that you will contact our call center and they will then book a slot with your, your body shops or, or with your service head technicians to complete whatever job you need to complete. And they'll book us up, so they may book for two o'clock this afternoon. At two o'clock in the afternoon, our technicians will make contact with the body shop. The, the repairer needs to then plug that dongle in. And then once he's plugged that dongle in, our technicians can effectively then take control of that car. They are then in control of that car remotely doing whatever job that person requires us to do. That's the dongle with the Aztec VHC unit. Yeah. The Aztec unit, which is the one above, uh, that's based around an app process. So effectively, you plug that in. There's no need to make a call. You plug it in. You connect it to an app that you have on a tablet or a mobile phone. That will then connect you to our technicians in real time who will then talk to you as a repairer to give you the confirmation of what work you require on that vehicle. So the process behind the scenes is exactly the same. You get the same technicians. You get the same OE tools. It's just the way you get to those technicians is slightly different depending on whether you have an Aztec unit or you're a VAC 2.5, you do have the dongle. And the one at the top, the Aztec unit, Richard, does that plug into the OBD on the vehicle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. plug straight into the OBD 2 port on the vehicle. As yeah, I said, it's linked, it's linked to an app. There's an app process whereby you just connect the app to the, the, the device via Wi-Fi, and then you just submit the job that you require within a matter of less than a couple of minutes at the moment. Our technicians are talking to the technicians to validate what jobs required, validate the vehicle if need be. Uh, and if it's a calibration requirement, they will discuss the boards that the repairer has uh, and where to position those boards in preparation for whatever calibrations are done. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, no, not sure if you're covering this later, Richard, but obviously it's important that they'll, they'll, they'll need internet access at, at this point as well. I want those for you to be able to connect as well. Yeah, I mean, it's all obvious, but I just want yeah. to mention it. No, it, it's a very valid point. And, and I think that's a great point to also mention that when it comes to doing things like um, coding and programming, we would always suggest that the device is connected in via an Ethernet cable to the internet. Yeah. Um, because if a, a vehicle drops out and the Wi Fi connectivity to the device drops out halfway through doing some coding and programming, You've got a major problem at that particular point. Um, yeah. so we always say to people, you should have an Ethernet cable logged into the devices just to ensure that you have that consistent connection to the to the Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's, it's not that hard either, is it? So you, you know, you can no, no, just for anyone listening, we just oh, cable, sorry, Tom, very cheaply, and just run it through the workshop. Um, That's exactly what we done. Yeah, plugged it straight yeah. into the switch on the server and just run one across the top of the roof, and it um and and just straight down into the workshop so we, we've a, enough room so it doesn't have to stay in one bay but yeah it just plugs directly into to the router it, you know it was a half hour job and, and just got a 50 meter length of cable you know yeah. brought straight off the internet yeah but yeah and, i wouldn't and, recommend doing it doing these kind of things over wi-fi no they will it will work it will work but you have that risk and i think we, we've seen that we have we have we have repairers that we work with today who just don't have an ethernet cable and they're still getting the service from us remotely but there is always that risk that if it drops out for any reason then effectively you might have an issue with that vehicle particularly with the coding and programming if it's a scan we just restart the scan and do it again it's not problems if it's volco clear we can restart those they're not massive jobs coding and programming jobs can take hours 
So effectively, you need to ensure that you have got that maintained connection to the Wi-Fi. Um, to cool. support. Oh. And the other prerequisite is probably the battery conditioning as well. Yeah, yeah. You just beat, vehicles. Yeah, you beat me to that. So we need to ensure that the battery does retain its strength. So we always suggest that they would connect the car to a battery power so that they don't lose the power within that vehicle uh, whilst we complete those jobs, whatever they may be. Yeah. Um, so to sort of put this into some, some logic around those two devices. So your, your tablet there, the, the second image, the big tablet, effectively you'll use that for your pre and your post sweeps on your standard vehicles that are potentially, I would say, up to 2018, 2019 vehicles. There may be some newer vehicles in it, but that's essentially how we would work. So you would do your standard kind of diagnostics and clearing and, and scanning for that tool. If it's a newer vehicle that that device doesn't recognize, you can use either dongle to connect to a technician who can do your scanning, your pre and post sweep, as we've called it there, over the air, just using a technician using the OE tool. So it's really kind of a gap filler for those vehicles that the tablet doesn't recognize and that essentially you would have to do something different, different with. Um, we've talked about secure gateway access. Um, you won't get that on the aftermarket devices. Uh, so that's something to be mindful of when people are, are repairing cars. Do those cars have the different secure gateways? One of the things I'm trying to do is raise some awareness around you know, which vehicles, when to plug the device in, when not to plug the device in, um, just to support the repairers um, so that they know, you know, by, by kind of standard what to plug in at what particular time, depending on what the vehicle is that they're seeing. Um, the difference between the pricing wise is obviously once you've bought the tablet or bought any aftermarket device, effectively you're just using that device for free once you've paid for the device. With the, the mobile remote service or the over the air service, there's effectively a transaction fee per job, depending on what job they choose to, to select. So if they choose a scan, there'll be a, a scan cost. If they choose a calibration, there'll be a calibration cost. That's all invoiced directly from Aztec to the repairer. Um, so effectively you'll get an invoice you can pass on to the insurance partner showing what work has been completed. They also come with a full report outlining exactly what's been completed on that, kind of what upgrades have been found and what the output of that vehicle is post the, the kind of post sweep of that particular vehicle. Um, it does say there that obviously the, the Aztec unit, there is a monthly fee of £45 over a two year period to effectively lease that device. Um, that £45 gives you access to all the OE tools that we have sitting on the shelf and we have all the tools on the shelf apart from Porsche as it stands today. Um, the last point there, Pete, you might want to talk about this, Pete, because I know you do this, but the, the VHC unit does link into the Aztec yeah. systems um, and we'll send port reports directly. Um, so Pete, you might want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, about a year and a half ago, we, we did start looking to see because there, there were other solutions. We'd all always used the um, the, the red diagnostics or, or, or the out of text tablet, um, but uh, as other solutions come on, but as none of them linked to out of text, and, and now in terms of getting paid for your pre and post sweeps, just about every insurance company now insists that they see a copy of the pre and post sweep. So rather than then have to mess around trying to get photos to prove that you've done it and then, you know, copy them and then upload them into Audotex, you know, this drops straight in to, to the images. So it makes, it's just one less admin task that you need to carry out and it just makes sure that you, you, you get paid for, for what you've done. So, you know, that's a great benefit and, you know, it was worth paying that little bit extra just to make sure that we, we, we get that on every job and, and you know, it never gets missed. So yeah, and it forms to the IIR as well. Then, Pete, it just makes it really slick. Yeah. Well, this is this is for the pre and the post sweeps. Yeah, the, the, this bit here. So, but yeah, it, it, the same for the ADAS for the digital ADAS as well. You, you know, you get electronic copies, and you know, anything that we can do to reduce the admin burden and an already busy department it, it is a good thing because now, you know, just about every authority they want you know pictures of every invoice, pictures of all your subcontracts. So you know there's already a big admin burden so you know having this transferred automatically um you know we see as a huge benefit yeah cool and i think just the, the point to make on that tom is that, that this is the vac 2.5 users effectively yes yeah. so there'll be repairers yeah. that are members of yours that don't have the vac 2.5 they're, they're currently not yet at that, at that phase so they won't have access to dongle and there's some limitations to what they can do um obviously anything that they, they've done remotely there is a pdf document sent via email to the, the body shops for them to also attach to the jobs. Uh, and effectively they could just copy that into the Aditex system as a, as a PDF, uh, yeah. you know, 
picture type thing to, to include on the job. So, you know, both both ways, depending on whether they use the system themselves directly as a VAC 2.5 or the remote service, they'll get something they can attach to the job to show what's happened. And as you rightly said, that then supports the IIR requirements, whereby you need to ensure that those, you know, that the, they prove what work has been done on that vehicle and it's been done correctly. Yeah, very cool. Okay, next slide then. Got uh we probably talked about a big chunk of this i think just in there yeah. one of the one of the key things to, to kind of mention is that the remote service is always oe only yeah so we don't use any aftermarket data or, or products behind the scenes so it just gives the members comfort to know if they do need us to get involved in a remote service then effectively they're going to be guaranteed to use the oe tool behind this behind the scenes so the same tool you'd use if you drove your car to the local dealer or yeah. the, the dealer would use effectively not you but um so yeah the main difference here sorry it's just that this you know the, the previous slide we're more talking about the pre and post sweeps and yeah. you know the uh, another uh, technical advancement now is the amount of um parts that need coded into the ecu and the car and you know we were seeing a, a greater demand for things that you know had to be coded in that we were either getting someone in to do it or having to send it to the dealers so again being able to do these things yourself uh, it, it is a great benefit in terms of, as it says, they're reducing key to key, and, and just being having the ability to to be self sufficient, really. Yeah, and it, and it keeps it in the repair process, you know, which which I think is key for a lot of people. Yes, in some cases you've got to potentially book a slot to have that work done. So if you book a slot in the afternoon, it might be the following morning before you actually get the slot if you make the call in the afternoon. But you're still in the repair process with an Aztec unit, the, the, the top unit that you can see. Then effectively that's that's real time, so you haven't got to book slots for that. But as Pete said, you know there are there's so many parts now that require coding and programming and 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 you know stuff to go with the part themselves. Headlamps is a really good example that you know that's sort of the area you would plug the dongle into but so you then have the technician doing that using the oe data and the oe systems directly um, and the easiest way for people to think about how to use this um so yeah so on this slide then richard i think that there's a couple of more important points as well so give time to productive to set up so you may provide an invoice but there's still time taken by the body shop it yeah to be booked onto the job yeah. So the, the body shop's not losing out, right? Completely agree. And, and I think is if I go back to the, the calibration scenario I talked about earlier, once you plug the, the remote service into the car, the repairer still has to set the boards up a certain distance from the car, certain height from the floor, confirm all that's done. So there's still an element of labor built into that within the repairer. Yes, we're yeah. carrying out calibration remotely and you'll get an invoice for the work that we do. But essentially, my view is that if there's labour involved in setting up that car ready to be calibrated using the remote service, then effectively that labour should be paid by the insurance company or allowed by the insurance company to get that car ready for whatever work needs to be carried out remotely. Yeah, and that, that that's quite an important piece because some insurance companies are sort of trying to argue that, aren't they, Pete? Saying that, you know, you, you, you've got the invoice from Aztec, that's all we're paying. And you say, well, hang on a minute. Yeah, half an hour to set this vehicle up ready for Aztec to get involved. Then there's a technician on standby to do any adjustments to the vehicle that the technician's suggesting. So, you know, just yeah, it depends on the the, 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 the technological the, the technology. You if it's a calibration, then yeah, the, the, the guy has to be there for the coding issues. Yeah, you know, we still leave someone with the car just to you know, because sometimes there are things that need doing so. Um, and again, depending on what solution you do. So if you're getting someone in to do it, you, you know, you're going to get the, the invoice is probably more expensive. So by doing it yourself, it, it, you're going to do yourself out of revenue. You, you know, the, the guys still need to plug it in. still need to follow the, You know, we allow, you know, about an hour for the, um, for the guys to do this. So the, the, there's a charge for doing it and an hour's labor um, for, the, for the guys to do it. Yeah. And going on to the proof of installation. So if you recode a steering rack, for instance, yeah. what, what proof do you give to say that's coded correctly? Yeah, so what, what we, our technicians effectively take all the information out of the OE tool. So whatever the OE tool information gives, we effectively retype that or we re-put that into our own document that we send out to people. So they'll get full confirmation of exactly what's been done. Um, we don't 
provide copies of what comes out of the OE tool. Um, that's something we are looking at at the moment. Do we take a screenshot of that to show that the OE tool has been used? And would that provide support to the repairers by doing so? We've not been asked to do that yet because people are accepting the Aztec document as being sufficient. Um, but there may be a time when someone does challenge that, at which point that's fine. We will have to take screenshots of the actual OE tool being used. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the reports that we send out to people give full kind of validation of everything that we've if we've scanned. It will give you confirmation of what we found. It will tell you what fault codes are unable to be cleared. Um, we, we do a lot of recommendations in terms of what people need to do. So let's say, as an example, the car's got fault codes on the back of the car, but the front end was involved in the crash. Then in effect, we will notify the repairer that the car has got rear end fault codes that don't relate to the crash, but they are fault codes that do need to be rectified. Um, and that could have been a previous crash. It could be that the codes are not working because of, of, of wiring or, or there might just be a general, you know, OE fault to that, that particular part. And we will notify them that as well. So we provide full recommendations of exactly what we're finding on those cars at whatever point we scan or, or do the job. Okay. And we're not going to, we're not going to pass on from profit stream cost in time. Because of course not. That's, that's that, not is, no. that is one of the reasons that everyone's joined the call, I think. Yeah, probably. And, and I think, you know, that, We'll probably get more into that when we get into the digital ADAS solution. I think so. Profit stream, and, uh, take remote services. There is a profit stream there, um, without a doubt. We we will build that out as an RRP, uh, and we provide a kind of discounted model, so the repairers will benefit from a, a, a rebate, effectively a discounted rebate model. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later, I guess, when we get into the actual pricing structure. Okay. Um, the, the profit more comes into when you start doing your own ADAS calibrations in house using the digital kits. Um, because effectively the way we've priced that means that there's a huge amount of margin available for repairers that are using that device. Okay. The, the other important thing here is that on something like a radar, where you've got a code array, you know, that the coding is a separate process to code it as it is to calibrate it. And, and again, we yeah. need re repairers, you know, we all need to make sure that that's down as two separate, you know, you use two separate tools. It's, it's two completely separate operations. So, yeah. you know, the, there's a charge for coding the radar to the to the ECU in the car, and then there'll be a charge for calibrating it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Ant's just put up the slide to reference all the capabilities of ADAS on a vehicle, which is, you know, it, it, it's similar technology to the last couple of years, but it, it, there's a lot going on with the vehicle at the moment, isn't there? So, yeah, um, and I... And I think if you look at this slide, it probably should give people kind of a, an overview awareness of exactly what they need to be mindful of. The biggest problem that this industry currently faces is the lack of awareness of what technology is in that car before you get the car in. Um, you know, I'm talking to companies about helping them with the ethnic process to provide them with knowledge to say that that car's got tech in it. Therefore, it needs to go to a repairer that can cope with that tech. Um, it can't go to a fast fit center or it can't go to a MIDI center, whatever because that tech needs to be calibrated. If you think about a 360 degree, as they call it on here, surround view, that you need a lot of space around the car to do that. Yeah, you're limited to the places you can do that. So this just highlights and demonstrates how much technology is now built into cars. And realistically, all that technology has been put into that car for a reason. And that reason is for safety of not only the occupants in that car, but obviously people on the outside of that vehicle, be it a, a secondary car, be it pedestrians, you know, whatever that may be. Um, and, 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 you know, the importance for us is actually highlighting that if the technology isn't calibrated correctly, what's going to be the output of that? Well, the car's not going to perform the way it was designed to perform. You know, if that sensor in the windscreen is pointing a millimetre down, as an example, where is it now pointing? Is it pointing onto the bonnet rather than pointing to the road? If it's a millimetre up at the screen, how far down the road is that now picking up cars versus what it was designed to do when it was originally calibrated? So it just highlights, really, this slide highlights the technology, but it also highlights the need for me uh, within this business to understand that, you know, how important this technology is and how it's really important that, you know, people understand the technology and what they need to do to try and ensure that technology is back to as it was pre-accident um, so that that car will perform as it was designed to perform. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. And, and you know, the insurance companies through probably what, 80% of the work, they've got a duty to indemnify the customer, put the vehicle back as it was prior to the accident. So A, it all needs to be working correctly. But from what you've said previously, a deep scan will tell you any um, pre-existing issues that are going on with the vehicle. So yeah. that could be a multitude of things now that could, you know, yeah. you need to highlight that at the start of the repair, not at the end of the repair. 100%. You're going to be 
caught with a bill that you're not going to be able to pass on to the insurer. Yeah. And ultimately, the customer is probably going to deny. And, and you know what? We, I've seen various examples of that in the, in the last kind of 18 months of being in this industry. And I think that the, the problem you have is if you don't do the correct, as you've said, Tom, don't, don't do the correct analysis or the diagnostic scan at the earliest point, you won't know what fault codes are on that vehicle. If you do a scan at the earliest point and your device doesn't have that vehicle in the database, you won't find any fault codes, even though that car's got fault codes. And unfortunately, yeah. what the devices say, the device will tell you there's no fault codes found when the reality is that they just couldn't even recognize the car because it didn't have that data in their database. So now as a repairer, what do you do? You assume, therefore, that car's got no fault codes. It's not till later in the process that you realize that, that car's got a bumper in the sensor or, or whatever it may be, sorry, sensor in the bumper, yeah. that you realize that car has actually got fault codes because as soon as that bumper or the radar's disconnected, that needs to be recalibrated. So I think it just shows how dangerous it is. But, you know, my, my, my view is, logical view, is that you should do a, a, a full OE scan at the earliest point on the newer vehicles that have technology built into them to ensure that every time you are going to understand what fault codes are on that particular car. It's the only way to know for certain every single time. Yeah. Pete, you were going to say something, right? Well, yeah, it's just, just Richard's covered it there, really. Uh, the the, the grey area is, you know, is whatever you're doing to repair that car, you know, does it affect the um, the performance of, of one of these bits of ADAS technology? And, and, and it's, and it's really critical, you know, even, you know, taking the bumper off, and you know, you might put it on exactly, but that will always, even if the bumper wasn't damaged, that, that will need calibrating, um, you know. And each one of these technologies is a different calibration as well. You know, ADAS doesn't, there isn't one bit of kit that you plug in and it does it all magically at once, you know. Um, if you was to do the radar and the camera, you know, then that would be two ADAS scans as well. So... There's lots of things that you need to be aware of and, you know, your, your VDAs will, will need to spend time working out, you know, at the start, what what ADAS technology exists and, you know, do we need to do it? And this is the issue that exists in terms of trying to, to, to work out whether insurance companies are, are liable to pay for this. But, you know, and we've had an example last week where, you know, the car came in for rear end damage, but the it was coming up with um, uh, a front ADAS issue. It, you know, it's a safety critical issue. So we can't yeah. send the car back, you know, like that. Yeah. No. And the other issue is if, if the vehicle's had a new windscreen and it's got ADAS on it, perhaps a camera, um, and the windscreen company potentially may not have the capability to recalibrate the vehicle, it could be coming into you as a hot potato. 100%. Yeah. And that, that is without a doubt happening today. You know, I know from the people that we talk to, the, 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 the potential customers that we have conversations about the kit that we provide and you ask them what they're doing today and, and they don't have kit that does it. So any new vehicle that a windscreen company sees that doesn't um, have the calibration requirements or the calibration kit, um, effectively, you're in a position whereby that car is no longer calibrated correctly. If it's not calibrated correctly, essentially that car's not going to do what it's designed to do. Now, does that then result in a secondary accident? Is that going to cause an accident because that car now that should be avoiding cars in front or anything like that, is that effectively going to now not do that and therefore become an accident? Yeah, and then, then, then who's liable for it? Yeah. It's a real hot potato of, of understanding exactly what the implications are of these things not being done correctly at the point in time they need to be done. You know, you look at tyres as an example, you know, if you have four new tires on a car, it requires a wheel alignment. That requires a calibration. But how many people are doing calibrations? Well, potentially it does. I mean, you need to be led by the vehicle repair method state. So I think that's your Bible for all of this. If you go to the vehicle repair methods and it states that, you know, taking a bumper off, you don't need to calibrate. That's fine. That's what they're yeah. suggesting. On other manufacturers, they say, just removing the bumper that's not even attached to the radar, but is in front of the radar, you need to then calibrate. Yep. So we can't assume just because one vehicle does one thing, another is going to follow suit. It's completely not that way. No. Um, but yeah. All right. And next slide, please. So this is um this is effectively the the ADAS calibration the digital ADAS calibration offer that we we've created uh, in terms of the market uh, as we sit here today. Um, this allows repairers to do the calibrations themselves in house um, without the need to get a third party in or to you know take cars to a, to a dealer or whatever to do calibrations. Um, 
So the, the offer as it stands is that you can either buy the kit, so there's an offer to be able to purchase it directly, um, which comes with a, an additional year's worth of, of updates. Um, or alternatively, the bit that we're offering up now, which a lot of repairers are taking up, is this page and calibrate service. Effectively, what we're doing is we're not charging anything for the kit up front. Um, so they're getting effectively getting 15 and a half to 20,000 pounds of a kit, depending on how much kit we actually provide as part of the, the package. Uh, and then all we would charge is a minimum of two jobs per week. So if you don't do any jobs, we'll still charge you 110 pound a week. The most we're going to charge is for four jobs, which is 55 pound, therefore 220 pound a week. Job number five to whatever job they do for calibrations in that week, we don't charge any more for. So if you think about from an insurance perspective, the average cost of a calibration with the insurance market is about 180 pound ish. Um, so paying me 55, you're generating 125 pound profit on those calibrations that are completed less the labor that you need to do to carry those jobs out. I'm pretty sure there's labor involved in that as well. Obviously, if you then do job number five, you're not paying me anything, either the 55, so you're making a full 180 pound profit on that particular job pre-labor. So um, Richard, you're, you're, you're giving that picture at the top is the yep. red diagnostic kit. Yep. That's not that's not a target board. That's nope. a TV on that kit. That's right? a beautiful TV screen. Yeah. So you're digital. Yep. All that plus what the Aztec or the other piece of kit. No, so that, that's that's kind of standalone. Uh, so that right. comes with a, okay. kind of like a little mini computer that has the database of vehicles built into it that we will then update accordingly over a th you know three year period. We update it every year for three years. So that's basically a hardware computer that's attached to that TV screen. Um, that you then tell the computer what board you want the TV screen to show and it then creates that TV screen image for the target. Um, and then that will then provide the calibration service based upon putting the specifications into that device for the car. Um, so yes, yeah, kind of purposely does it does its own thing. So that's what the, that's what the offer is for the, that, this unit by itself. Okay. Um, some of the some of the obvious thing it's it's been tested by Thatcham, so it's therefore compliant with the IR requirements. Um, it pretty much covers every make or model uh, that's available on, on boards today. Uh, it covers every single one of those. Follows the OEM procedures. Um, really, really simple to set up and, and operate. You know, I've been out now to various demos that my team do, um, and with that, unlike boards, solid frame boards, you don't have to be exact with this because you tell the the, the system how far away the front wheels are. And Pete might want to jump in at this point because they've obviously been using this. Um, but that's really quite clever from a perspective of being able to, um, you know, be, be kind of a bit clever with the way they do the calibrations and not quite so specific. I know that sounds like a weird thing to say, but because it's computer technology doing it, effectively it'll work out the distances to do the calibrations correctly. Um, whereas if you have a, a solid plain board, i.e. A, a wooden board, you have to be exact in terms of your measurements on either side. Do you want to just flick back that previous slide, Anthony? Sorry. Pete, do you want to just... Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, we, we, we actually did, um, we did have the one with the manual boards and then we made a decision to move away from them to the digital boards um, for ease of use and just for the flexibility. The, the problem with the, the manual boards is, is that, you know, to be completely self-sufficient, you might have boards that you only use once in a blue moon and, you know, at 500 pound a pop, um, you know, it's an expensive way of doing it. Whereas the digital solution, um, it's just so much easier to set up, as Richard said, you, you know, the car can then work out the distance and everything. And, you know, th there is a, a time saving, but overall, it's just the flexibility. It, it, it's the way to go forward. You know, we decided that, you know, the manual boards wasn't really the the way to continue because we were still having to get people in because it's like, do we pay for a board or... Or, or um, sub subcontract it out, and we, we didn't want to go down the subcontract route. You know, we, we want to be able to do as much. We want to be able to get every car that we can and, and deal with it ourselves without relying on third parties. Pete, on this then, so did you just upgrade, or was it a completely different system you had? And you've got no, no, it's a completely different system. Yeah. Okay. And what? So it. Is it the digital that you were attracted to, or was it the cost yeah, yeah. offering? Or no, the no, the digital. No, up? no, we'd already <laughs> we'd already laid out on, on on the first one on the board. So you know, this was purely um, to make the technician's life easier, right. and we saw it as the the solution. In, you know, to go forward because you know these boards as as they introduce new technical solutions into cars. That, that will always require new boards. So with the manual board, you're never going to stop. There's no 
end point, is it? It's almost a gift that keeps taking in terms of investment, really. You, you know, yeah. you always have to go out and buy new boards when new cars come out. But uh, now all we all we wait on really is, um, you, you know, the, the next time they, uh, they they bring out an update. And even if it's a brand new car that we haven't got the update for that, then they can, we, we can set it up and um, Aztec can dial in and, and calibrate it remotely as well. So we're never yeah. really not going to be able to do it. So we just saw that, you know, coupled with the fact, you know, my own view is, is that, you know, that there'll be a point where you're going to have to do an ADAS calibration just about on every car, really, because every car's got it and you don't really want to run the risk. You know, the, the, the mute point will be, is that, is it not calibrated as part of the accident? But, you know, it's our name when, we put, when we've repaired that car, you know, that car needs to be safe for, for anyone to drive. So, yeah. you know, ADAS is just going to, it's never going to go away. It's, it's going to be more and more. We've done some work in terms of how many times we were doing calibrations and it had gone up, you know, fivefold in two years, really, for the volume of cars that we were doing a couple of years ago was maybe one a week across three sites and now we're doing you know two or three a week per site you know yeah. and that will only increase more and more so Agreed. yeah on just an opportunity all the participants on the call today there's a Q&A so if you want to click on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen throw your questions at the panelists and we'll answer them or we'll do our very best to so if we can generate some questions um, and try and challenge Pete and Richard that'd be great um, Richard, you're going to say something, weren't you? Yeah, I'll, I'll sure subscribe to, to that when I sort of do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer your questions, Pete. And I, and I think that, that Pete sort of loosely mentioned this, but actually the other thing to remember is that that this effectively can just be used as a target board. So yes, you can do a number of calibrations using this, the kit as it comes, the, the TV screen with the kit that comes with it. You can do your own calibrations. If it's, let's say, it's a 2021 vehicle that the, we don't have yet the database of information built into the, the computer within the TV, Effectively, you just use the, the target board, you use the TV as a target, and then you plug in the Aztec unit or the dongle from the VAC device, and then the calibration is done by our remote technicians using just the TV screen as the target. So it kind of works hand in hand with both. You either do it yourself if you can, um, or if you can't, just use the TV screen effectively as a target that we will then complete the calibration um, doing that, that system directly with the, the paired devices. Cool. Um, so yeah, yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah. No, move it along yeah let's move it so, so this, i mean this effectively is just what the offer is so the the, the tv screen is a 65 inch tv screen you, you get complete full on-site training so one of our guys gareth will come out and do full training on how to use the system uh, he'll do a calibration for you to show how easy it is to do it we've we've shown various people now um i think you were going to mention about the lv but we have a partnership with lv insurance now whereby they are promoting the aztec and the red diagnostics units to their their repairers um, they've had the training to see how simple the device was to use. Um, all available from camera boards are included. We've already mentioned Wi-Fi in a bit of detail. Um, and there's other things that come with it, like your laser reflectors and your, your front mounted lasers and, and wheel clamps, etc. So, um, And it's really, really easy to set up. Uh, I think that's one of the key bits to this is it's so simple to set up. I was stunned by how easy it was when I started to play with it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not a tech. I'm not a tech. So for me to be able to work out how to use it is, um, is quite a big thing. Okay, next slide then. So uh, this is kind of uh, the sort of offering that we provide. Um, so mobile technicians we talked about in terms of providing the same consistent service using the, uh, the Aztec units, um, scanning and diagnostic services, uh, with some people call it health check, um, some people call it clearance, but that's scanning and diagnostics, um, camera and radar calibrations with or without codings, as Pete mentioned before, programming of various other modules on the cars, we talked about that, handbrakes, headlamps, all those kind of bits and pieces, city brake, LIDAR resets, and the 360 degree camera calibration. That's effectively the, the key sort of services that we, we offer in terms of the mobile uh, solution or alternatively the over the air solution um so it doesn't yeah. matter if you're using a technician over the air or a technician coming to your site that's effectively the services that you can get from our from our guys so the next slide sort of 
Kind of that a bit there. Yeah, so I put this together really early stages to try and help people understand the difference and where the Aztec unit or the, the VHC dongle units effectively can, can support repairers. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom. So I've already mentioned that the aftermarket device is essentially our data. So it's data that's downloaded into the device that will then try and read the car. So if the data has that vehicle in it, it'll read the car. Great, no problem. If it doesn't recognize that vehicle for whatever reason, you won't get a response back. You'll just get no fault codes found. So that in itself is a risk if that car has got fault codes and that device doesn't have the latest information. I will give you a quick story on this, is that I was with a body shop who has a device that he has to update every year, hadn't updated it for at least four years, and probably had the device for six years, which effectively means every car that he scanned that's less than six years old and found no fault codes likely will have had fault codes on the car. It's just the device doesn't recognize the car, not the car didn't have fault codes. So that's kind of an example of the aftermarket devices. Um, this is not about, you know, slagging off aftermarket devices. There's some really good devices out there. This is just about understanding whether that device does or doesn't recognize the car. And that's the, the sort of missing piece of this jigsaw is effectively how do we educate people enough to know when to plug a device in and when not to plug a device in. So going to the top, the top box, um, today, if you don't have a, an over-the-air service, effectively you have to drive that car to a dealer. They will plug the OE tool into that car to carry out whatever work is required with the Aztec unit or the dongle with the VAC 2.5. Effectively, you're plugging into the same OE tool. You're just not having to drive that car to a dealer. So this was just a graphic just to demonstrate, you know, the, the value of not having to move around to get the same service that you'd get if you drove that car to a dealer. This yeah. is not, and by, by, by no means is this saying to people don't have OE approvals, you know, because people have those for lots of reasons. So this is not about ditching approvals. This is about if you have a car in that you haven't got an approval for, then plug the Aztec unit or the dongle, it will then give you the OE service. If you have an approval with the OE kit, carry on using that all day long. At the end of the day, the repair is going to find their own path anyway, Richard. So yeah, exactly, it's, exactly that. It's it's just another tool in their arsenal that they can yeah. use to cut down on key to key and create some more profit within their business. Yeah, exactly that. And we've got repairers who have OE, OE approvals and they'll carry on using the OE tools they get from as part of that approval process. Great, use it. But if you get a, a different car coming in the next day that, that you haven't got a piece of kit for, then plug in the engine, take you know, the dongle yeah. and it'll do that job for you. So this is really about supporting people to give them access to as many devices as they can to, to ensure those cars are done effectively as, as possible. Yeah. So the next slide is going to be an overview of what we've spoken about. So yeah. we're, we're, we're just... This will be available if you go back onto the webinar or you download the presentation pack. Yeah, and, that's what we need to go through that. Yeah, so next slide again, please, Ant. And these, so this, these are the yeah. tips as to what you need to do for ADAS, whether it be calibration or, you know, if you're going to be programming a computer. Yeah. So we, we sort of put this together because I think ADES is one of those things that, that people are confused about generally. I, I think people don't fully understand what you need to do to ensure the cars are going to be set up ready to do calibrations. I mean, I've seen examples of third parties doing calibrations in gravel car parks, which is just completely not a nonsense because the car has to be on a flat level surface, as an example. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to repairers who get third parties in to come and do calibrations and the car's never had a board put in front of it or been driven for dynamic. Again, they're not doing calibrations, they're clearing fault codes and wiping lights. So people got to be careful careful in terms of what they're going to do in terms of who they're using to do these these things but this is basically just nine key points that we kind of get asked every single day by people when it comes to the calibration service top one i think there's one that pete mentioned i think um in previous calls we've had not not today but you need to check the vehicle has had geometry alignment uh, and has a report to, to, because if the car's not correctly aligned then effectively the calibration won't be done properly um so that's a real, real key issue. Um, make sure both the car and the calibration equipment are on level ground, as I've already mentioned. The calibration area is clear of reflective objects, toolboxes, trolleys, etc., because uh, that can affect the target imagery. Um, you need to visually inspect the components to be calibrated, i.e. The, the sensors, the radars, you know, to ensure they're not blocked or dirty. And there's an issue now with regards to paint on, on bumpers, as an example. Does that affect the cameras and they can't do calibrations correctly? Yes is the answer to that question. Um, if a new component's been fitted, check if the component requires coding prior to calibration, as Pete mentioned earlier. You know, coding is one job, calibration is the next. Um, ensure vehicle has a correct tire pressure. If the vehicle has an empty load, use weights to stimulate the full tank or, or load, and that's in line with the OE method. So they'll tell you what that needs to be. 
you know, always make sure the steering wheel is in the horizontal position and the wheels are straight. And then lastly, if the component's non-adjustable, just check the bodywork that is, is um, fitted to has been replaced. If so, it then requires a calibration. So that's just a few. I mean, we could have written hundreds, I think, of the... the could, but I think if we, you know, if anyone on the call is, you know, inquisitive or needs more information, either give Richard a ring or me a ring, and we'll go through what parameters you need for setting up ADAS, lighting, flat surface, space around the vehicle, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, next slide, Ant, we're gonna get onto the money now, Richard. Yeah, so we, we did have some of this information in the previous slide, but I will I will go through it. So in terms of the VAC units, effectively, if you're an Adatex VAC 2.5, you're paying for that anyway as a standard subscription. Um, so that's what you're getting. You pay, I think it's 180 pound a month to have access to the VAC units. So you pay nothing extra to Aztec or Red in terms of using that kit. If you want an Aztec unit, the purchase price is, is £1,100. Or alternatively, as I've mentioned, there's a subscription model, which effectively is £45 a month over a two-year period. That's a lease model. That £45 gives you access to the OE tools. There's no additional cost. If you don't use the service, all you're paying is £45 a month. You only then pay based upon whatever transaction, whatever you do to choose, i.e. a scan, calibration, etc. Um, dealer on demand coding, as we mentioned, no monthly or setup fees, pay per use, um, headlamps, coding, racks, etc. There's, there's prices for those. The digital ADAS kit, um, we've already talked about this in a bit of detail, but I'll go through it again. There is a members offer, 15,500 plus VAT for the standard system. That includes one year's updates. After the first year, the updates are then effectively £1,000, 999 per annum. Um, we are supplying probably 99% of the kits we're now providing to repairers are all on the pay as you go calibration service um, because the zero for upfront cost and there's a minimum or maximum charge depending on how many jobs are done uh, each week um, that's effectively what we're offering up and, and that's what's flying out the door at the moment to repairers yeah so repairers keep their capital and they pay yep. on that so yeah exactly i mean it's a lease it's a lease model they don't own a kit it's a three-year deal um yeah. But effectively, in the three year, they can upgrade to the next the next amount of tech that comes out when they get a new tech and they carry on doing the, the leasing agreement. Um, what happens if it updates before that three years? So there's a new iconic. They, they come and talk to me and negotiate. Ah, there you go. All right, next slide, please, then. So this is the cost yeah. is based on what operation you'll be doing on the vehicle. Yeah, um, so this is when they plug in an over-the-air service. So if they plug in the dongle or plug in the Aztec unit, the, this is effectively the price list for the services that we offer. So if someone plugs in an Aztec unit, let's keep it simple, the Aztec unit, they want to do a deep scan, as we've called it here, then effectively the RRP for that is, is £50. That's, that's because I have a technician sitting there with his bum on his seat with the OE tool that he has to connect to, uh, and that then takes him a period of time depending on how many fault codes he can find on that car. Most scans take 10, 15, 20 minutes at most. We have seen scans take an hour, um, and that's because the car was riddled with fault codes. Um, so every fault code we find, we have to do an analysis and then document, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have had some extremes, um, but essentially they probably take 20 minutes at most to do a, a full OE, OE scan. If there are code fault codes to be cleared, then there's an additional charge to clear fault codes, as you can see there. Then you get into your coding stuff, um, for your, your keys and your racks, etc. And then when we get into the ADAS world, you know, you've got your camera calibrations, you've got your, your subsequent calibration. So what that means is if we do two calibrations on the same vehicle, i.e. for different cameras or different radars, then effectively we won't charge you twice. We're already in the tool. So I've effectively already paid to access that, that tool by my subscription model. Um, so I can do two calibrations slightly cheaper. So yeah, the first one's 175, second one will be 100. Uh, if we do coding whilst doing calibrations, then effectively we'll charge 250, which is the 175 plus a 75 cost for doing the, the coding. Because um, again, I'm in the tool. So once you're in the tool, we've paid for the access. So effectively you can then complete the jobs while you're in it. Uh, and then the last one we need to put, pick up there is about the on-site workshop solutions. That's a straight £250 if you pull it in to do the job. A technician will arrive and do whatever he needs to do on that car for 250 quid. Um, so it's quite a good offering. Um, it gets used, not probably as much as we expected it to, but it's getting used by people just to do the problem jobs that they can't do themselves. So all that, Richard, you got, yep. you know, all these costings seem pretty transparent. Yep. And like we said earlier, um, LV have adopted extremely similar costings to that. Yep. So the synergy is there. Yeah. So, you know, the, the friction won't be there when you're saying, right, I need to put a new radar in and I need to calibrate it. So they've already got the costings that are aligned to this. Yeah. And that seems to be a big issue, doesn't it, Pete, with, 
you know, work providers and ANS at the moment, there's a bit of friction between, you know, I needed to do this. And they're saying, well, we're only going to pay once. So this will cut down on a lot of that. Order. It, it, yeah, it comes back to the same. It's just a lack of understanding of, of what the technology is and, and the differences between, you know, people are not clear on, you know, the difference between coding and calibration and that, you know, each device that needs calibrating is a separate, you know, it's a separate task to do. Yeah. So if you do have to do two ADES calibrations, yeah, you're using the same kit, but it needs to be set up twice. And, you yeah. know, as I said, you know, the technician's got to do that operation twice and he'll get a report to say the first device has been calibrated and a second report to say the second device has been calibrated. And, and yeah, you know, that the, there can be a, the second calibration can be done at a, a cheaper price, but it's still got to be carried out and you've still got to prove that you've done it. So yeah. it's, you know, and, you know, what we've found ourselves is the, the more information you can share with your own staff and, and the better understanding they have of, of what the technology is and, and what it needs doing, then the more chance you've got of, of, of getting getting paid for that because there is a lack of understanding. You know, I've had uh, conversations with engineers where they didn't understand that, you know, two different uh, ADAS calibrations is, is two separate operations, you, you know, yeah. where they were trying to knock one off, you, you know. It's in their nature. They're always going to try and, um, and, and reduce costs, but you've got to be geared up with the knowledge to fight your corner and, and to be able to argue why this happened, you know, why it needs to happen or what you need to do to, to, um, to make sure that car goes out safely. At the end of the day, all these items on here are all to do with safety. Yeah, yeah so, they are safety critical. So yeah. if an engineer says one of them doesn't need to be done, then you need to argue because yeah. this is, you know, that's one of the reasons they invest so heavily in Thatcham is to do the, the, the pre-research on this type of thing and to say this is exactly what needs to be done to the vehicle. And again, revert back to the methods. So on this, Richard, I assume if you charge out these amounts, depending on the contract for the work provider, they'll be able to put 10 or 15% more yeah. as a sublet. Yeah, so they, they, I believe a number of insurers allow that now. They're 10 or 15% on top. So effectively, for your deep scan at 10%, you'd be £55. You'd be billing that to the insurance company. I think, as I mentioned at the start, there was a there was a discounted model that we provide to repairers to use the service. Uh, that discount is 20%. Um, so I think from a perspective of repairers, making 20% off of that cost as well, as well as the, the 15 to 15% that he's moving on to the top. So that's where there's this margin, not as much margin in, in the remote service, because obviously I've got a technician doing it. So there's not so much to give when they do their own calibrations. That's effectively where they make the margin. Um, and you know, I'm aware of people already using the ADAS kits to outsource that to other companies in and around the body shop. That could be windscreen companies. It could be SMR companies. It could be fleets who don't have calibration kits, but need calibrations doing. Um, so I think people are starting to realize there's a business opportunity to be able to potentially get other cars in to do specific ADAS jobs um, with, with the kit they've already paid, you know, two or four times a 55 pound charge out for. So, um, yeah, so it, 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 this is the RRP. As I said, there's a discounted structure that the repairs get. Which means effectively, even though the RRP would be 50, they won't be paying 50 to us, they'll get the discounted model. Yeah. So if you had to calibrate a radar, then you'd probably make £61.25 off the top of my head. Um, profit that's off that. Right. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you, you'd obviously be charging out labour as well for yeah. a technician. So, and you haven't got to put the upfront cost up of buying all the kit. So yeah. it does seem like if, if you haven't got on the ADAS sort of, coach yet then this is one way of doing it and you know an easy way to do it as well yeah and uh, i think a couple of things to mention on this as, as you mentioned about the labor tom absolutely repairers should be charging labor for the work they do to get the car set up uh, for a yeah. scan for a scan it's like less than a minute two minutes at most to plug it into the obd and send yeah. the job to my technician that's not difficult for calibrations absolutely encoding there is a labor element that should be built back to the insurer as well the other thing is, this is a consistent price across the board. Doesn't matter what insurer you're working with, the price is always consistent. And the third point is that the price doesn't differ based upon vehicle manufacturer unless they charge me a surcharge. So that little bit at the bottom here, which is the 45, 50, 15, and 260s, that's the additional surcharge I get hit by the vehicle manufacturer for using their tool. Yeah. So in that case, they'll hit me with 45 pounds. Now those tokens effectively do last for a week. So if you do the same car over a week period, I don't get charged twice. But I do get whacked with a, an additional surcharge by the vehicle manufacturers every time we use that tool. Okay, thank and you. We'll pass, we'll pass that one. 
So there are no questions, I have to say. So we, we must have been very good in explaining everything. That's all I can say. Of course. So I think takeaways are if you want more information, then please contact Richard. He's more than happy to talk to you about, you know, the packages that have been discussed today. If you've got any other queries that you have for reference ADAS, give me a call. Um, I think, you know, if you're going to go on to ADAS and you're going to make this part of your business, which I don't see that you have an awful lot of choice, if I'm honest, then methods is the other thing you need to think about. And MBRA members have a deal with all data. So if you haven't got methods, then give me a call anyway. Um, I'd really like to thank Pete. You've been a star. It's been really useful having you on the webinar today as, you know, an independent voice and why you've made the decisions you have. Richard, thank you very much for giving us all the detail for today and the offering to the MBRA. And, you know, I wish you every success in your business. And thank you all for today. Thank you for dialing in. Thank you for spending an hour with us. And until the next webinar, I bid you farewell and a happy Christmas if I don't speak to you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. For Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank Cheers. you. Everyone. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.